Yeah, hello. My name is Bruce Slutsky from the Robert Van Houten Library here at NGIT. And what I want to do in this lecture is to show students how to find information in chemistry, environmental science, and chemical engineering. I've given this lecture many times, and it's suited for both undergraduate and graduate students. So it's very important that you know what resources are available to you and how to use them efficiently to find the information that you need for coursework or for uh, research that you're doing here. Okay, so we talk about the scientific method. So the scientific method is done by people who are conducting experiments. You need to know the principles behind what you're trying to do and apply those principles when you're doing an experiment. So an experiment has to be planned with the knowing the uh, thought and using the thought processes before you even conduct the experiment you really need to know what you're doing. Likewise, when you're looking for information, there's so much out there and you really have to develop a strategy before you even start to look and use thought processes before you go on the computer. The computer databases are very fast. They'll find information for you, but is it the information you want? So it's really thought processes. You have to guide the databases to find the information that you need. Okay, so there are similarities between the scientific method and the method of finding information retrieval. So in the scientific method, you know your subject, but you, you're trying to find a new effect. You require new knowledge. You propose the experiment based on what you know and the laboratory equipment and procedures. You actually conduct that experiment. Scientific experiments may be very long, they may be hours, they may even be days. So you conduct the experiment and you observe and interpret the results and you may have to repeat that experiment, revising it, do using different parameters. And you need to interpret the final outcome of the experiment. So the process of interpreting the experiment might be even longer than it is to actually conduct it. Now with information retrieval, you need to know the scope and the contents of the databases in the field. You're looking for new knowledge. You want to make sure that nobody has done your research before you. You want to do something new. So you devise an initial search strategy based on relevant terminology in the subject databases. And fortunately, this really only takes seconds. You put a search strategy in a database and it just takes a few seconds. And you examine the initial set and you have to see, is it on the mark? And if it's not, you need to revise the strategy based on the findings from the initial answer set. You may have to use different terms. You may have to use a different database. And you examine that final answer set. And if the documents are relevant, you need to find them and then eventually use that information that you found in a search. Okay, so this also is represented on this uh, slide here. You develop and understand the research question. You brainstorm for, for keywords, synonyms, for concepts. You do the search, evaluate the results, and if necessary, repeat this process again. Okay, moving on. So there are various formats of the scientific and technical literature that I will discuss here. The journal, the conference proceeding, magazines, review journals, books, encyclopedias, and data compilations. Okay, what is a journal? Okay, a journal is a publication issued periodically that reports original research. So that's very important that anything in a journal is original research. You can't repeat what somebody else has done. It includes detailed articles with experimental procedures. A journal article will be highly specialized, really only suited for people who are doing research in that area. And it undergoes the peer review process.
and I'd like to discuss that peer review process in some detail. Okay, so a scientist writes a paper and submits it to a journal. Okay, he has an idea of the journals in his field and which journal is appropriate for the subject. The editor looks at that quickly and just verifies that it is the right uh, journal for that specific topic, but he must send it to other specialists in the field for anonymous review of the paper for the quality and originality. So the person who's writing the paper does not know who reviews it, and the people who are reviewing the paper don't know who the writer is. They check, was the work done properly? Is the discovery original? Is the subject appropriate for the journal? And what, what's most important is reproducibility. Will other scientists be able to understand and repeat the experiment with the same results? And the editor gets a report from the reviewer and he uses the comment to accept the manuscript as it is, reject it completely, or very often they just require revisions. So that is the peer review process, which I really think students here should understand. And here are some selected journals uh, in chemistry, environmental science, and chemical engineering that are subscription-based. Now, back in the uh, old days, so to speak, that we received journals in print, and we would have a subscription to them, and they would be mailed to us. So now, all the journals that we get are electronic. So even though they're electronic and on the web, we, um, we must pay for them. So let's take a look at a, an article and let's pick one of these journals. Let's try Journal of Membrane Science. We'll click on here and we'll get a link to the Journal of Membrane Science. Okay, here we go. All right, so again, judge, judging by the title, it will only accept articles about membrane science and technology. So it's taking a few seconds to load up here. Okay. So um, let's take a look at an article um, example here. Ultra-thin, multi-layered, polyamide membrane synthesis and characterization. So as an abstract here. Now the abstract is a one-paragraph summary that the title of the article is one sentence and you don't know from that one sentence necessarily is this something that I want to read. So it gives you an indication of what is done in the paper. If you do like the paper here from what the abstract indicates, you can click on PDF and it'll give you the full text of that paper. So you see here, it repeats the abstract. Okay, it gives you an, the, the title, the authors, the author's affiliation, the introduction, some diagrams here, tables, uh, the detailed experimental procedures, more diagrams. So you see the paper is very long, it's very detailed, it's really only for specialists. Okay, and then a conclusion, there are more graphs here and it will give you here at the end a bibliography. Okay, so you can look at some of the articles in the bibliography. And they even very often provide links to the articles in the bibliography. So that's one example of a journal article which is very much detailed. Okay, let's go back to our um, PowerPoint now. Okay, what are open access journals? Okay, I think graduate students especially should really know what this means. So open access journals are on the web but they're free to everybody and like a subscription-based journal the articles undergo that very rigorous peer review process before they're accepted for publication. Now instead of a library paying for the journal that the actual people who are doing the research after the article is accepted pays uh, for the uh, article to be published. 
it's often done by uh, the grant that the professor has to write the paper. And very often the publicly funded research, especially in the medical area, must be po open access. The reasoning is that since the research is supported by tax dollars, that the public who pays the taxes should have uh, access to the research that was done. And here are some examples of some open access journals in chemistry or chemical engineering. Okay. What is a conference proceeding? Professional societies like the American Chemical Society and the American Institute of Chemical Engineers have conferences all the time so that the scientists and engineers report their original research. But only the people who are at the conference hear it. So there must be a permanent record of what goes on at that conference. So conferences can be one-time events, they can be held yearly, every two years, and so on. So here are some examples of some conference proceedings here. Um, International Flavor Conference, the 11th in 2004 in Greece, where, where the, it's a very important source of original research. Now, review journals, as you saw before in, in the article in the Journal of Membrane Science, they're very detailed. So a review journal is a condensed version of the research journal omitting the very detailed experimental procedures and it summarizes research. So here's an example here of a few research review journals. Annual Review of Biochemistry, Annual Review of Physical Chemistry, and Chemical Reviews. So they're very important. If you read it, an article in one of these journals and are interested, it'll give you a, rev a reference to the original research where you can read about the detailed experimental procedures. Magazines. Okay, so we saw before that the journal articles are very technical, using very specialized language. So it really, it translates the research into a more general language suited for a more general audience. And very often these articles are written by journalists rather than researchers. There are some magazines that are suitable for practicing scientists. There are some magazines for the general public. So here, uh, Chemical and Engineering News, published by the American Chemical Society, Chemical Engineering Progress, if you're a member of the AICHE, you'll get that. Chemical Week is more of a business publication. Very often a scientist and engineer has to know what's going on in the business that they're in. And Scientific American is an example of a magazine for the lay public. A monograph is, a, is another name for a book. So books, of course, are written at all levels. And it reports research over a longer period of time. And it brings the research to a much wider audience. OK, a data compilation extracts selected pieces of information from the journal literature. So it might be limited by the type of compound or property, you know, physical properties, thermodynamic properties, and so on. So they may be print or electronic. Certainly over recent years that the traditional data compilations have made a transition from print to electronic. And here are some examples. ChemSpider is free on the web. The CRC Handbook of Chemistry and Physics must be around for about 100 years. The NIF, NIST JANF Thermochemical Tables. The um, NIST Webbook. That's free on the web. NIST is National Institutes for Science and Technology. Thermodynamic Properties. Novel is an aggregation of over 700 handbooks. That subscription base, we pay for it at NJIT, so you can do a search over 700 handbooks. 
and I teach a class here in Math 225, Physical Properties of Chemical and Thermodynamic Properties, and I discuss that in, in more detail. See, so again, here's novel. It's actually now over 800 handbooks. Um, so if you have a chance, you can search a novel yourself. I think it's very important. You're not going to learn these things but by watching this presentation. You really need to go into these services and do some practice searches yourself. Okay, so here's an example of some of the handbooks in novel. Uh, chemistry of the Elements, Electrochemical Data, and so on. Okay, encyclopedias. Encyclopedias, by their nature, are very general. They introduce people to a specialized field of studies. So we have a handful of them in print format. The Kirk Othmer Encyclopedia of Chemical Technology, Ullman's Encyclopedia of Industrial Chemistry, and so on. So if you're really not familiar with a topic, probably encyclopedia is a good place to start your research. And then, of course, there's the Wikipedia, which has become very popular over the last 10 or 15 years or so. But it can be trusted as a source of chemical information. Okay, because as you know, the Wikipedia, anybody can write an article, somebody else can change it, so you really don't know how reliable that information is in the Wikipedia. Okay, so of course, it has, it's good for obtaining background knowledge on a topic. Um, the articles can be revised and edited quickly. Some articles on Wikipedia are better than others. I think a sign of a good Wikipedia article is that there's a bibliography at the end which you can consult for more specialized sources. So I think you should, it's, it, it's not a bad idea these days. I think the quality of it is, is better than it was maybe a few years ago. Wikipedia does have a staff of volunteers who do review the articles. Uh, there's actually a YouTube video here which uh, supports Wikipedia as a reliable source of chemical information. In the uh, physical properties class that I give, I have students check for values in the Wikipedia and they find that they match other sources. But again, look at it, but it's not the, the end. You should s consult with other sources as well. Okay, so scientists scientific information flows. It flows from somebody who's creating it to somebody who needs it. Uh, it's published in journal articles, conference proceeding articles, and then eventually people who need it find it. So you look in this next slide here, okay, from journal articles it would go into books, monographs, called the secondary literature, and then go into the tertiary literature, handbooks, encyclopedias, and textbooks. So students like yourself should start out at this tertiary literature. Look for information in textbooks, encyclopedias, handbooks, even the Wikipedia. And if that's not sufficient, look more into books and into journal articles. But how do you get at the journal articles. We used to call them indexes and abstracts, but now we refer to them as databases. So most of the rest of this presentation will be devoted to databases that we have here at the NJIT library. Okay, types of databases. There's the bibliographic database, includes the elements needed to identify the document the author, the title, the name of the journal, year, and so on. And now there's something called a digital object identifier, a character string that's used to identify the electronic document. Okay, the abstract is a one-paragraph summary of the article. So we saw that the, uh, the original journal article we saw in the Journal of Membrane Science had an abstract. The databases 
have abstracts as well and we'll see that in a few minutes after I finish this PowerPoint presentation we'll do a sample database search and a full text database includes the entire article in electronic format and the data compilation as I mentioned includes only the specific data elements such as thermodynamic or spectral data limitations of databases no database covers everything in terms of subject and journal and the dates vary as well in general the more recent the information is the more likely it is available in electronic format okay okay so we'll discuss a few of these databases here and you're you're certainly welcome to look at them after you've completed this uh, presentation okay SciFinder SciFinder is the electronic version of chemical abstracts which goes back to 1907 to the present so even that older information was digitized contains links to the full text of the articles you can search on chemical substance reaction research topic author or affiliation so in a few minutes I'll do a sample search using SciFinder okay another thing about SciFinder there are how-to guides okay uh, they're pretty short and if you go to the chemical abstract service home page www.cas.org you can search on a link for training okay and there are YouTube videos some of them are done by the people at chemical abstract service some of them are done by people at other universities uh, you can look through those as well to learn how to search SciFinder now while I'm discussing SciFinder I need to discuss the chemical abstract service registry number every unique chemical substance is given a registry number so it's actually easier to search on a specific chemical substance using the registry number rather than the name sometimes names are ambiguous and you'll see many handbooks and other databases use this CAS number okay so keep that in mind okay another thing before I go on to Scopus and I'll show you this later with SciFinder you uh, need to set up an account you only need to do that once and it's the only database here at NGIT where you have to use um, an account the others you just access okay so Scopus is multidisciplinary SciFinder is chemistry and related disciplines but Scopus covers all the STEM disciplines it does not go quite as far back as SciFinder but it's a very useful database and it might provide you with enough information okay so again the coverage and the index of SciFinder and Scopus differ so it's always good to search more than one database okay and it's now a lot of these services are even available on phones on smartphones okay there are publisher databases SciFinder and Scopus are bibliographic databases but they do provide links to the publisher specific databases which include the full text of the article so the American Chemical Society has journals so you might do a search in SciFinder and it'll give you a link to an article in the American Chemical Society journals you can search on these databases but you will be limited to articles by that specific publisher so there are professional society publishers but there are also profit-making organizations like Elsevier Springer and Wiley that are in the publishing business okay so keep that in mind here's an example of some of the American Chemical Society journals okay they're excellent they're very highly respected in the um, scientific community here's an example of a few here 
Science Direct is published by Elsevier. Elsevier is the world's largest publisher of STEM literature. Here's an example of some of their journals. They do also publish Scopus. Okay, so here's an example. Journal of Membrane Science that we looked at before is an Elsevier journal in Science Direct. Okay, Search All is a service of the, um, of the NGIT library. It's provided to us by EBSCO, which is another database publisher. It aggregates several NGIT databases, but it does not include SciFinder. It does include Scopus, Science Direct, Wiley, and others. And the nice thing about Search All is you can limit by peer review and full text av availability at NJIT. Okay, the availability of journals, we don't get anything in print anymore, but some of the older ones here are still available only in print. Electronic only, that's the way we're going now. And sometimes there's a, a, a mark where, say, before a certain date, the journal is available in print, and after a certain date, it's only available in electronic format. Okay, and I mentioned before, open access journals. And also, we have an interlibrary loan service. Did any book or periodical article that you need that we don't have at the NGIT library, you can order through interlibrary loan. Okay, uh, with the library homepage, you don't have to come to the library any longer to use our resources. They're available electronically. Um, it's library.ngit.edu, and it's the link here. Let me just show you a couple of the resources that I have here. Selected resources in chemistry and chemical engineering. I'll click on this link here, and it's research guides. .ngit.edu, and I have um, several, I have tutorials here, um, and so on. You'll find this tutorial here on this page, but I have selected guides to chemistry resources on the web and selected internet resources. So I do suggest if you have time, look at some of these resources. Most of them are free on the web. And you're certainly welcome to use that. Here I am. You can email me if you, you have any questions. So if you get a chance, we'll use that. There's another one, researchguides.ngit.edu underscore and physical underscore properties. Whoops, okay. Okay, again here I have a multitude of resources here where you can find physical properties of chemical substances. Um, you're certainly welcome to look at this, look at some of the links, so you'll be familiar with them, so when a real question comes up, you're uh, ready um, to use them. Okay, let's go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, evaluating websites. You can find very uh, important information in websites. Some websites are better than others. I think you have to be careful that many websites there are commercial. They're trying to sell you something. So when you evaluate websites, you use what we call the crap test. Is it current? A good website will have the date on it when it was last revised. Is it relevant? Who's the authority? Who wrote this website? Okay, is it a professor? Or is it somebody at a company trying to sell a product? Where does the information come from? Is it accurate? And what is it, its purpose? So keep that in mind when you, you do a, a search on Google and you find websites. Voyager is the, the NGIT library catalog. Interlibrary loan, I mentioned that. But when you do submit a request through interlibrary loan, always be as complete submitting the information. If you submit incomplete information, it will just delay your request. There are some apps on the uh, phones, 
you know, ACS Mobile, Chem Spider, and so on. So if you like search information on your phone, you can certainly do that. Okay, and here's my name um, in the departments. I'm liaison to. I have a degree in chemistry, so I'm very happy to help you with your research needs at the NGIT library. There's my email. There's my phone. I'll leave this up here for a few seconds if you want to copy it down. Okay, so let's try a sample search here. Find references to the doping of carbon nanotubes with phosphorus, and we'll use SciFinder, Scopus, and Search All. Okay, so that kind of ends um, the uh, the PowerPoint. So let's go to the library homepage here. So the library homepage is the door to our resources. So if you want to search for a book, you search here. Link to the database is here. If you want to search on a specific journal, you search here. Uh, it will tell you if we have it. If so, is it print or electronic? And search to the research guide like I showed you before. And interlibrary loan. Click here and it will give you a link to the page where you insert the information. Okay. All right. So let's go to databases, and we're going to search on SciFinder. Okay, so if you don't have an account with SciFinder, what you should do first is register. You only have to do this once while you're here at NGIT. You know, give your name, your email, username, and password. It will send you a link to your email. You authenticate, and then you only have to do that once, and you have your SciFinder account uh, as long as you're a student here at NJIT. Okay, so going back to this again, uh, we'll go on to the SciFinder on the web. Here is, I'll put, use my account sign in okay here we are so you can search references research topic author name company name and so on you can search for a chemical substance and you can search on a reaction so i highly suggest you look at those videos that chemical abstract service provides and that'll give you more instruction on how to um uses the uh, the database so we're going to say here as we had done before um, doping you know they know you like Google so the search box looks like the Google search box doping of carbon nanotubes by uh, with I'll say with phosphorus Okay. Okay. So it tells you here 136 references will find containing all the concepts doping, carbon nanotubes, and phosphorus. So I'm going to click on this 136 here. Okay, you see how fast that was within seconds. Okay. So it eliminates duplicates. When you're searching SciFind, you're searching chemical abstracts um, service um, and Medline. Okay, you can refine. Let's show you how to refine. Let's take out um, limited to journal articles. Let's just show you how to do that. Okay, so what you need to do here, this is the human part, is to evaluate the articles as they, they, as they come out the database. You can export it and evaluate it offline, or you can evaluate it while you're using the database. So there's, I limited it now, there's 92 left. I took out maybe conference proceedings and patents. So here's one here, this number nine looks very good. Phosphorus dope single wall carbon nanotubes with loaded with nanoparticles of iron phosphite and iron carbide for efficient 
hydrogen evolution. Okay? Now, click here. Okay, it gives you the abstract. The abstract is that one paragraph summary which helps you decide if you want to see this whole article. Now, if you like that, it's a little confusing. A link to other sources. Retrieve the full text of this record. Click here. Okay. PDF from publisher. Click here. So it went from SciFinder. Okay. Now, what this is here, when it's asking you to buy the article, that means we don't have access to it. We don't have a subscription to Journal of Material Chemistry A. So if you would need to order this through interlibrary loan. Okay? So yeah, that's not obvious when you're doing a search in SciFinder. Okay, let's go back. Let's look at another one. Okay, go back here. Okay, let's look at another one. Here it says phosphorus bonding in single wool carbon nanotubes studied by X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and DFT calculations. Now here again, here here's the abstract you like on this. Click on link to other sources. And here two HTML from publisher. And this is a case, this is go this is a science direct journal by Elsevier. We have this journal and we'll click here on article and there's your article. Okay. Again, you can download it, print it out, and so on. Okay, so the first one we didn't have access to, the second one we did. Okay, so let's get out of SciFinder for now. Okay, sign out, and let's go into Scopus. Okay, so go back to the library homepage. Databases. Scopus, and you see Scopus will have a different interface. See what you have to do here is add another search box. Here's the Boolean AND. We'll do it again, get another Boolean AND. So I'm going to say doping and carbon nanotubes. and phosphorus. Okay, search. It took only a couple of seconds. It was 71. Okay, you can sort on date. The most recent come up first, but you can sort on relevance. You can't do that in SciFinder. Okay, so you see here, Okay, this number six, heterodope nanotubes, theory, synthesis, and characterization of phosphorus, nitrogen, dope, multi-walled. So it does seem to match the um, search question. View abstract here. Abstract gives you more information. Check for full text. ACS Nano, that's an American Chemical Society journal. We have that one. View PDF. And there's your article. Okay. And before I conclude this little uh, presentation, we'll go into uh, Search All. Search All, we want advanced search. And I'm going to say here, doping. You can you can use a pull down menu if you want. Doping. 
carbon nano and carbon nanotubes and phosphorus okay search 83 but what I'm gonna do here okay it's sorted by relevance limit to full text so this way you won't have to worry about getting an article that we don't have at the NGIT library okay so here's one here additional doping of phosphorus into polypyrrole da 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 you like the article you want to see it in a little more detail okay here's your um uh, abstract you can see a little bit more detail and if you like this see, even though this article is it was written in China it's an English article view article in science direct and there's download PDF okay and there's the article there okay so again I thank you for taking the time to look at this presentation I hope it's beneficial to you but the important thing is to follow through on what you've seen to do some sample searches yourself so when a case comes when you need to do a literature search you really know how to use the tools again my name is Bruce Slutsky you're certainly free to contact me and I'll be very happy to help you with your research endeavors here at NGIT